Hi, uh, welcome to our talk. In this talk, we are going to bypass AMD Platform Secure Boot. We are going to activate some soft locked features um, on a Tesla. And we go one step further and extract some hardware bound authentication keys from Teslas. This story began around one year ago when Oleg uh, approached us. Oleg already owned a Tesla and was interested in how its digital systems worked in detail. But ever since Tesla switched to AMD based CPUs, Oleg wasn't uh, able to be the king of his car anymore. So he contacted us because we worked a lot with AMD in the past. Uh, we started in around 2019 to publish research about its um, secure processor, especially. But why would you jailbreak a car in the first place? Well, many reasons. One of them could be like Oleg, that you want to just look around, so curiosity. One could be that you want to entirely replace its software. Or something in between, you just want to activate some features you would normally pay for. One of which, in a Tesla, could be the rear seat heaters. Um, even though your Tesla might have them installed, in order to be able to use them, you would have to pay another $300. So in the talk, we are going to, um, we are going to first analyze the boot and firmware security of Teslas. In the second part, Niklas will show you how we applied voltage glitching to the system. And in the third part, Hans Niklas will get into some crypto and see and show you how we um, extracted some car unique secrets from the firmware TPM. So this is a Model 3 car computer. It's located behind the glove box. You can buy it on eBay from salvaged cars for around $400. When you take the top cap off, then you will see the infotainment and connectivity ECU. Um, this is the one that we will focus on in this talk. However, to give you a complete picture, there's more layers to this. Um, the whole thing is water-cooled, there's some space for a GPU daughter board for the premium cars. And then one layer below, there's this custom DualSock ARM64-based system. This is the autopilot, which we will not cover today. So back to this ICE board. If we flip this one, there's um, the back side. And the first chip that's, uh, that's important to us is the gateway, an NXP-based microcontroller, PowerPC um, instruction set architecture, um, has some free artist-based operating system. It has an SD card for storing some, some logs. It boots from internal flash, but most importantly, it manages the so-called car configuration. The car configuration lists um, what um, paid or otherwise hardware and software features the car has. Um, they affect car performance, the battery capacity. Yes, they are Teslas out there with a bigger battery than what the user is able to use. And the level of autopilot. The car region is another detail um, and for us, and this demonstration, we are mostly interested in the rear seat heaters. The second chip and the one we feel most competent for is this infotainment APU. It's a Zen 1 CPU, AMD Zen 1. It has a Vega GPU inside. It runs a more or less uh, recent Linux, um, has its firmware and recovery system on SPI flash, and the system and user partition are stored in NVMe. This chip was previously based on Intel and in the very beginning on NVIDIA Tegra. We're not the first ones to attack Teslas. The Freefall and over the air attack um, did, um, used a, a WebKit based um, exploit with some more zero days to get all the way to CAN bus and open the trunk. And then at Pwn2Own, to own fluoroacetate um, did the same thing, this time on Chromium, because Tesla switched from WebKit to Chromium. The T1 attack complemented this whole scheme by taking a drone that would spawn an access point, the Tesla service network, that the Tesla would um, automatically connect to, and um, then they used a, um, a bug in the Conman DHCP uh, stack. Uh, Synactive did the same thing again at Pwn2Own 2022. What all of these attacks have in common is that their threat model is 
these are outsiders who um, are either completely remote or in physical proximity. They want to get access to the car uh, anyways. And um, how they did it was through software-based vulnerabilities. These were all fixed over the air um, by Tesla. Our threat model is a bit different. We are an insider and we already have physical and digital access to the car. Our goal is to tweak the car beyond its normal um, behavior and, for example, activate some soft lock features. It could also help to lift repair and regulation restrictions. So as an insider, we're not limited to software-based attacks. Um, and let's look at how this works during boot. So um, when you hook up to the infotainment system um, is through to its serial port, you will see that the x86 boots up with um, Core Boot, an open source x86 firmware project. And this first Core Boot stage will then verify, load and verify the Tesla OS loader, a component by, by Tesla that will um, load the actual Linux kernel, the first component that's stored on the NVMe and not on the SPI flash. The Linux kernel now will only load the root file system um, and, and continue running if it is able to verify this one. So what you see here is a chain of trust. These four stages secure each other through um, yeah, cryptographic signatures. So how do we get our root shell here? Many options, we could spawn a serial shell on boot, we could add an SSH key. What we did is we added a known SSH password to the system. But this of course requires changes to the root file system. So this will break this chain of trust and the Linux kernel won't happily verify the root file system anymore, but fail. How did it um, verify it in the first place, that's through DM Verity. DM Verity is a target for the device mapper kernel module that allows transparent integrity checking of block devices on Linux. So whenever a block is read into memory, it's also hashed in parallel. Using a hash tree or a Merkle tree, um, it can then, then um, efficiently compute if um, this is part of a trusted file system and the whole file system can be represented by this root hash. Intermediate hashes are stored alongside the data on disk. So what we did here is we went into the Linux kernel and did a very simple patch by um, saying don't restart on corruption but ignore corruptions. As you, can, um, as you might imagine, this will now allow the Linux kernel to accept the root file system, but now the Linux kernel is the tainted one. Three ways to fix this. Either we try to generate a valid signature of the Linux kernel that the Tesla OS loader would accept. Well, we can't do that because we don't control the private key to the public key used here. Secondly, we could uh, exchange the trusted public key by the Tesla OS loader. We tried to do that through some core boot utils, but didn't succeed. So we went again for the hacky way. You see here an excerpt from Jydra. On the left, you see the um, disassembly. On the right, the decompilation of the Tesla OS loader. And there you can see this um, big if statement. So if this succeeds, it says successfully verified image. Otherwise, it um, says invalid boot image and won't continue booting. So we just took that conditional jump here, replaced it by an unconditional jump, uh, no rocket science, um, and this allowed us to boot the Linux kernel, or would have allowed us um, if it wasn't for core boot now, failing to verify the Tesla OS loader. I'm not going to bore you with this patch. It's the very same library. It's uh, the vboot library, verified boot library, that was originally developed by the Chromebook team and added to core boot. That's used here. We did a very similar patch here. And when we did this patch, the system would just not boot anymore at all. Why is that? Enter the AMD Secure Processor. An ARM v7 microcontroller included in the AMD SOC, highly privileged, has a variety of responsibilities, one of which is um, being hardware root of trust. So um, the way it works is that this AMD SP comes up before the x86 even comes up, and its off-chip bootloader will verify the very first code that's run on the x86, in this case, the core boot payload. But 
since we patched it, it will fail. This whole procedure is called AMD Platform Secure Boot. And even though we've looked at a lot of AMD-based systems in the past years, this is the first time we've seen this in action. So bad luck here. We could now go ahead and patch the off-chip bootloader, and we have the tooling to do that. PSP tool, for example, allows you to change these data structures. But then the ROM bootloader won't accept the off-chip bootloader anymore. Well, it's a chain of trust, after all. So we need to talk about the SP's vulnerabilities. In 2019, there was the off-chip bootloader buffer overflow. That was very handy in this case because it allowed arbitrary code execution and that also means you can skip the check. It was fixed via firmware updates. In 2020, even handier, there was a ROM bootloader buffer overflow. So ROM stands for read-only memory, as you probably know. This one wasn't fixable through software by AMD. And to our knowledge, it was only fixed in newer generations like Zen 2 and onwards. But it seemed Tesla got special treatment here, and this, these fixes were backported to Tesla's Zen 1 APU as well. So let's step back now and look at Tesla's security. As far as we know, in 2013, there were open X servers all around, hard-coded passwords. You just had to connect via Ethernet and basically were root. There was also no code signing. Now in 2023, it looks pretty solid. There's firmware and operating system signing, there's a chain of trust during boot, and this root of trust, most importantly, is in the AMD SOC. So with that, we had to get another weapon from our arsenal. And with this, I'm going to hand you over to Niklas. Okay, so I'll talk about um, how we hotwired the infotainment system. Um, for this, we will first have a look at how a regular early boot verification looks like. Um, at first, the AMD secret processor loads the AMD root key from SPI flash, uh, then computes uh, the hash of this AMD root key and compares uh, the computed hash to a hash that is uh, stored in read-only memory. Um, if this is successful, the ASP loads and verifies the off-chip bootloader using this arc. And um, what's interesting here is that um, Tesla has its own custom root key here and doesn't use the AMD one anymore. But um, as an attacker, we would like um, to replace uh, the AMD root key by our own one. Uh, but in this case, um, the key verification would, uh, would just fail. Uh, and the boot process is uh, stopped completely. Um, but let's uh, think about what happens if we could do something about this here. Um, okay, so fault injection is a method where an attacker induces faults by altering the IC's environment. For this, we could um, hit an IC with a laser or with EM radiation, for example. But we could also try to modify the clock signal or the supply voltage. Um, in case of voltage glitching, um, the supply voltage is lower for a very short amount of time, um, just as you can see on the picture below. Um, let's consider a password check where the user types in a wrong password. Normally, um, this check would just fail, but if we, are now, if we now inject a fault into the processor, it may ignore the comparison, and um, this check would not fail anymore. <clears throat> But unfortunately, in, in most cases, we introduce other errors like uh, system locks or system resets. So most faults are useless for us as an attacker. And that's why we um, have to adjust the glitch, uh, which brings us to the three main challenges. Um, first, we need to figure out when the targeted check happens um, to be able to precisely trigger the actual attack. And secondly, it is important to choose uh, proper glitch parameters. Uh, in case of voltage glitching, uh, these could be, for example, the voltage drop steepness or the width of the voltage drop. And um, finally, uh, we must be able to identify if the attack was successful, and we must find a way to reset the target uh, as fast as possible so that we are able to try as many parameters as possible in a short amount of time. Okay, so that's uh, from where we are coming. Uh, the arc is replaced by our own key, but its verification is going to fail. Um, so our plan is now to glitch the arc verification so that our custom root key, root key is accepted, 
And this would also allow us um, to resign the modified off-chip bootloader, which then will get verified uh, or successfully verified too. Mm. To make this happen, uh, we first need to find out uh, when the arc, verifica arc verification takes place during boot. Um, here you can see a SPI trace of a regular boot with the original uh, root key. And the only thing we can tell is that the MD root key is loaded right here, but we don't know when it gets verified. Um, but now we flipped a bit in the uh, root key verification and captured another SPI trace. And with the modified uh, root key, the SPI activity just stops completely uh, after loading the key, which means that the root key must be verified um, during this red dotted uh, time window here. And this time window is small enough uh, so that we can just brute force um, uh, the correct time when we have to trigger the glitch. Okay, so after this root key verification, the off-chip bootloader is loaded and, and verified, of course. Okay, so we now know when we have to trigger the glitch, but we don't know um, how to inject the actual voltage drop. Um, for this, we will have a look at um, how the AMD SOC is powered. Um, it is powered by an external voltage regulator that is connected uh, to the S3i2 bus of the SM AMD SOC so that the SOC itself is able to set its, its own voltage. Um, it supports uh, two voltage domains, uh, namely VSOC and VCore. And VSOC is responsible uh, to, to power the uh, AMD SP here. So VSOC is the voltage rail we would like to inject our voltage drop. Okay, um, our glitch setup um, looks like this. Um, we have a TNC micro uh, TNC microcontroller that is responsible uh, for the whole glitch. It is uh, connected to the SVI2 bus so that we are able to inject SVI2 packets um, and so that we are able to control the output voltage of the voltage regulator directly. Um, it is also connected uh, to the ATX reset line so that we are able to reset the target as fast as possible. And it, of course, monitors uh, the SPI bus um, so that we are able to, to trigger the glitch right on time. Uh, this whole setup is controlled by an external PC um, so that we are able to adjust the uh, voltage glitch parameters and to capture some logs. Okay, for, for our tech, only three wires uh, have to be soldered to the infotainment board, uh, two wires to the SVI2 bus for data and clock, and one wire to the SPI chip select line. Yeah, in, in reality, our setup looks a little bit messier, more like, more like this. Um, here you can see the SVI2 bus connection. Um, here's our TNC microcontroller. And in this, this case, we also sold out some more wires to the SPI bus so that we are able to, um, to debug the whole glitch attack using, using our logic analyzer. Interesting here is that um, Tesla misuses an HDMI connector for debugging purposes, and we were able to uh, connect the ATX reset line, the serial output, and an additional SPI programmer through that uh, connector. And this um, additional SPI programmer is used to uh, read and write to the flash chip directly, for example, to modify the AMD root key or to modify uh, other firmware components. Okay, so let's go through uh, the actual voltage glitching steps. Um, here you can see a logic analyzer trace of, of our glitch setup. Um, on the left side, the signals from top to bottom are the SVI tube uh, bus, uh, clock, and data. Then there's the target's voltage, and um, there's uh, the SPI chip select signal. One was captured during a failed attempt, and the other one was captured during a successful att uh, attempt. Um, first, uh, the initial voltage is set. Um, you can see the SVI2 packet here, which is sent by the CPU itself. And this packet tells the voltage regulator to rise uh, the target's voltage. And we also use this first uh, data packet to detect that the target begins booting. And that triggers uh, the attack logic that runs uh, on the TNC microcontroller. 
Yeah, after the initial voltage is reached, um, the voltage regulator starts sending tel telemetry packets, but as we would like to be able to inject our SVI2 commands uh, at any time, the TNZ just disables this telemetry functionality by injecting a SVI2 command, and it also adjusts uh, VSOC another time here. Um, in this step, the AMD circuit processor awakens and starts uh, loading data from the SPI flash, and that's why we see activity on the SPI chip select line here. Um, this activity is also used by, by the TNZ, uh, so the TNZ starts counting the chip select edges until it is time uh, to glitch uh, the target. And, and yeah, this time is just now, so now it's time to glitch, and the TNZ just injects a packet to make uh, first the voltage drop, and then it injects another packet uh, to make the voltage rise again. And to find out if this attack attempt was successful or not, the TNZ still monitors uh, the chip select line, and if it becomes active again, we can say that more data is loaded, and this also indicates that our attempt was successful. On a failed attempt, uh, no more data is loaded, um, the chip select line will stay inactive, and the TNZ resets the target to retry the, the attack. Um, yeah, to give you a short recap, um, we should now be able to circumvent this check now, and with this, we should also be able to patch all boot stages um, using our custom key, and, and of course, the glitch itself. And yeah, we have put our own SSH password into the root file system, and we connected the, the infotainment system to a PC via its Ethernet connection. Okay, so yeah, welcome to our lab. Um, as you can see, we don't have an actual car, but we have the monitor and the infotainment board. And in this video, you can see that we haven't bought the optional rear seat heaters. So we are not allowed to, to use them. Although we, we don't have any seats, but yeah. So um, yeah, this is a snippet from the car configuration. Um, the rear seat heaters have the ID13. And we would like to set uh, this value to one, but first, uh, of course, we need to get uh, a root shell on the infotainment system. Um, this video should demonstrate uh, the glitching attack. On the right side, you can see um, our glitch script that runs many glitch attempts as fast as possible. Um, on the top, top left side, there's the serial console to watch the boot log, and on the bottom left, uh, you can see the SSH console where we will log in as root to the infotainment system. <coughs> okay, so now we will start the glitch script, and as you can see, many attempts are rushing through. Now we had a successful attempt, and on the left side, we will see that the boot log will start, and after a while, we should be able to log in via SSH using our uh, custom password. Yeah, now we are on the infotainment system, and we will retrieve the gateway configuration for ID13. It is set to zero. We will set it to one now, <coughs> and check if the gateway accepted this, and it accepted this, but um, now we will have to check if the rear CT does are enabled, and for this we go back to our lab. We just rebooted the infotainment system, and let's see if the rear seat heaters are available now. Okay, so now we activated the rear seat heaters and yeah, our attack worked. Uh, And uh, while this car configuration survives uh, normal infotainment reboots, um, the voltage glitching attack is, of course, not persistent. But um, the infotainment system doesn't reboot very often, and additionally, we could make this glitching attack more convenient using a custom PCB or a mod chip or something like this. But this is more an implementation detail. Maybe someone of you wants to, wants to work on this. Um, yeah, um, our demo was possible because uh, the rear seat heaters have been an insecure configuration item that was not checked by the gateway. But with infotainment version 2022.44, the item uh, was upgraded to be a secured one, um, just like the full self-driving feature, for example. 
So being root on the infotainment is not sufficient anymore, and we would need another vulnerability in the gateway firmware to carry out the, the same attack again. But um, these vulnerabilities um, exist. Um, here's one that was presented by Zenactive during last uh, Pwn to Own, and it allowed to run unsigned uh, firmware on the gateway chip. Okay, so, but we got uh, one more thing for you. Um, Niklas will tell you about how he extracted uh, more secrets from the Tesla. Thank you, Niklas. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> you saw the title. We're going to talk about the secrets that we extracted from the Tesla. And the first secret that is actually present on this Tesla are the so-called car credentials. These are used by the car to authenticate against uh, the Tesla servers, for example, to download firmware upgrades or to receive uh, updates to the car configuration. And it's an asymmetric uh, RSA key um, that is unique for each car. It's also used to identify the car. Furthermore, we have a lot of user data on uh, Tesla cars, so a lot of details about the phones that are connected, which locations and when were visited by this Tesla car, as well as Wi-Fi passwords and account tokens for uh, yeah, accounts that you logged into with your Tesla. And the security of these used to be pretty bad, so everything uh, used to be clear text, which caused some bad press for Tesla. So here, for example, we have some news articles about uh, car hackers who bought infotainment units, just like we did, off of eBay, and were able to extract pretty sensitive user data from these cars. And because of this, Tesla is now uh, using uh, TPM-based security. So TPMs are trusted platform modules, are small crypt cryptographic modules that can seal cryptographic materials, like the car credentials or disk encryption keys for the now encrypted user data partition. And uh, TPMs can manage access, so for example, um, they uh, can enforce that the car credentials can be used by the Tesla car, but the real key can't be copied off of the system and can only be used by the hardware um, yeah, with the TPM. And luckily for us, actually, Tesla uses AMD's uh, firmware TPM here, which is usually TPMs are dedicated IC, but in this case, uh, it's actually software running on the AMD secure processor um, that implements this TPM specification. And as it turns out, uh, we already wrote a paper about um, yeah, attacking this firmware TPM uh, by AMD, where we extracted the internal state of the firmware TPM and used that to unseal TPM objects. TPM objects are um, the sealed cryptographic material um, because um, TPMs are rather small and you don't store everything on the TPM, but you seal it with the TPM and then load it when you, are, uh, when you want to use it. And actually for our Tesla attack, we had to go further than this attack and uh, implement uh, more complex unsealing to actually be able to uh, allow arbitrary TPM objects now to be unsealed. And with that, um, we extracted the car credentials, which gave us access uh, to the Tesla endpoints uh, meant for cars, as well as uh, re-enabling the uh, yeah, user uh, privacy leaking uh, from a uh, bored Tesla infotainment unit. So um, in general here, we have a simplified boot overview, and the encrypted user data partition uh, is now is also part of the NVMe, and the operating system would like to get access to this. Uh, in order to do that, it needs to communicate with the firmware TPM, which is actually a small application run on the AMD secure processor while um, the operating system is also running. And it's uh, run as one of uh, the many applications that can be run under the uh, secure OS microkernel, which uh, yeah, is in control of the AMD secure processor while the operating system is booted. And in general, it will work like this. The operating system can communicate with the AMD SP to ask the firmware TPM for the key for the user data partition, which it will return, and which the operating system then can use to unlock the user data partition. And now we we'll zoom a little bit into the details here, because the firmware TPM application needs some persistent state that's actually stored on the SPI flash chip alongside all of the firmware and so on. And, um, the uh, disk encryption key is actually stored in a TPM object that's uh, stored in clear text at the header of the encrypted user data partition. 
So what will happen in detail is the operating system will load this TPM object, give it to the FTPM application to unseal, uh, which will return the now unsealed contents, the disk encryption key, which can be used to unlock the user data partition. We'll uh, look at uh, TPM objects in detail now. So TPM objects uh, have a public part, which contains metadata, what kind of algorithm, and uh, when it, this object is allowed to be used, as well as the public key if it's an asymmetric object. Then we have a private part of the TPM object, which, no surprises here, contains the private key, but also a authentication value if, for example, user input is used to uh, uh, yeah, allow unseating of the object, and a cryptographic seed value, which we'll get to in a second. This, uh, for this TPM object, actually only the private part is encrypted and integrity protected, and um, this is the ceiling. And um, every TPM object is actually sealed against a parent object. So whenever you want to load or unseal a TPM object, you already have to have the parent object loaded. And um, the encryption keys for this to-be-loaded TPM object are actually derived from um, the seed value of the parent object as well as the public part of this TPM object. And it's important to note here that everything, uh, all the algorithms needed for the sealing are well specified by the TPM specification um, because later on we're going to see some cases where this is not the case, uh, yeah, which cause a lot of reverse engineering efforts for us. In general, uh, now uh, this looks uh, as follows. You have a TPM object that's sealed against the parent object. This parent object might seal other TBM objects. So we arrive at a tree structure, or more precisely, a forest structure of TPM objects. And at the root of this forest lie the so-called primary objects, which are also just regular TPM objects. They are just uh, not derived, uh, sorry, not sealed by parent objects. They are derived from a so-called primary seed. And um, if you are a user and you want to use uh, a TPM object like this one, for example, now you need to do something that uh, we call a TPM hierarchy walk. So you first need to derive a primary object, load any intermediate parent objects, and finally you are able to unseal your target object. And from the user's point of view, actually, the primary seed can just be considered to be there, which hints at the underlying storage structure because the only thing that the TPM actually needs to store uh, persistently is this primary seed. Everything else can either be derived at runtime or is stored uh, externally, uh, for example, on uh, the NVMe uh, or the uh, header of your encrypted drive. OK, uh, now uh, I talked about us um, being able to extract the non-volatile FTPM data. And I mean, that is exactly the, uh, the place where these primary seeds are stored. And of course, it needs to be integrity protected and encrypted. And uh, in order to extract it, we reverse engineered this um, key derivation algorithm for a fault TPM paper. Um, you don't need to look at uh, detail here. Just at the bottom, you have the two uh, storage and integrity keys. And in the middle here, in this key derivation algorithm, the uh, AMD root key is actually mixed in, which is a little bit uh, annoying for us because when we uh, rooted the system, we replaced the AMD root key to get root access. And that means that now we arrive at different uh, non-volatile data keys, and the T firmware TPM cannot load its, um, the original FTPM state anymore. OK, um, the primary source of entropy for this key derivation is actually something called the chip unique secret, which is just a cryptographic value unique to each uh, AMD CPU. And um, we would like to extract that to be able to perform this whole key derivation offline. Um, it's actually not as easy because this value is not directly accessible to software running on the AMD SP. It is uh, stored in a cryptographic coprocessor. But uh, we can nevertheless extract an intermediate value here, the so-called seed, which as only other input has a constant, so it's basically as good as extracting the chip, chip unique secret. Our tech looks the following. We have here our regular boot flow, and the non-volatile data is actually encrypted and integrity protected. And normally, the key, uh, the secret is passed on from the ROM bootloader to the FTPM application inside the cryptographic coprocessor. With our glitch, now we execute a small payload right after the ROM bootloader to extract um, this uh, chip unique secret, or actually the seed that we derived from it. And with that, we are now able to uh, derive the encryption keys for um, the non-volatile data and decrypt it offline. 
Overall, um, we now uh, want to also offline perform the cyber key walk, right? We have a TPM object that we have, uh, want to unseal, uh, and we uh, now would need to do this whole uh, hierarchy walk in order to actually get the correct unsealing keys. Um, for this process, we need the TPM objects, which we just assume to have because they're stored externally. We need to uh, do these uh, sealing steps, which are uh, specified by the TPM spec, so we know how to do those. But how do we get the primary objects? For our fault TPM paper, we're actually done here because the particular primary objects we were interested in are actually cached inside the non-volatile data, which uh, meant that we could just use those and uh, unseal uh, TPM objects from here. But for the Tesla case, we actually, they use different primary objects that are not cached, and therefore we need to go all the way back to the primary seed. The primary seed is part of the uh, non-volatile data, so we have access to that. And the, now we have this derivation step, which is kind of, um, uh, yeah, it's not as well specified as the sealing step because it doesn't need to be. Um, let's look into this uh, derivation step. So here we have a primary object that we want to derive. Um, in the derivation step, you have a object template as input, and this object template will give you most of the fields of the primary object already. Uh, the other fields are derived from a deterministic random bit generator, um, and that is uh, seeded with the input template and the primary seed for this object. Um, and uh, all of this is specified. The only thing that's not specified by the TPM specification is actually uh, which exact algorithm should be used in this uh, deterministic random bit generator. And that caused a lot of reverse engineering, which I wanted to present here, but sadly we have no time, so we'll just have to imagine it. Um, but yeah, after, afterwards, we are now able to unseal arbitrary TPM objects because we have this hierarchy work and we just reverse engineered the last two steps. We do have access to the encrypted non-volatile data because it's just part of the SPI flash chip. We have executed our payload to leak a secret seed from the CPU, which we can use to unlock the non-volatile data, which gives us access to the primary seed. All right, so um, if you fell asleep during all of that cryptography, then uh, now's the time to wake up because I'm gonna show you how it looks in practice. In practice, the car credentials are just a file stored on the Tesla, which we copied off of it here. It's a PEM encoded um, object with here the type trusted software stack to um, private key. And basically, this is, the, uh, yeah, this is the representation of the TPM object. Um, we've uh, written a little Python script that implements all of the derivation and unsealing logic. And as inputs, we give it the encrypted non-volatile data together with the extracted secret and the TPM object. And it will spit out a clear text version of uh, the yeah, now unsealed, in this case, car credentials, which uh, we can now just use with uh, regular OpenSSL. And uh, that's what we do here. We connect to a, a Tesla endpoint um, with OpenSSL. And as authentication, we, we use our clear text extracted car credentials together with a certificate for these car credentials. And uh, yeah, you can see that with the file we now created with the clear text version, we are able to do that from everywhere, not only from the Tesla car. And yeah, we in this case, just get some information about the car back from Tesla's production servers. Similarly, uh, it works with the disk encryption keys. Here we have some JSON in the looks header of the, um, of the encrypted user data partition with the TPM object. A similar Python script allows us to get the raw disk encryption key, which we can then use to uh, uh, load the uh, encrypted partition. And at the bottom here, you actually see that uh, we are able to access the phone book, which I've blurred mostly, just left in two names, um, yeah, of this uh, private data. Okay, that's all for our talk. Um, to summarize, um, we've given you an overview of Tesla's boot security, which we find to be rather good. And uh, from the software and arch software architectural side, everything seems secure. But with our hardware attack, our voltage fault injection attack, we are still able to root the infotainment unit and unlock the rear CT tests. And it's important to note here that this routing attack is not mitigatable without replacing hardware on this Tesla infotainment board. 
What this Tesla did mitigate was uh, the rear seat heaters being an unsecured config item. So now you would have to find an additional attack against the gateway to redo the unlocking attack. Finally, I just showed you that we extracted the car credentials as well as the disk encryption keys, and hopefully this will be of use to independent repairing people uh, that work on Teslas. What do we learn from our talk? Well, artificially disabling features that are available on the hardware that you own does open up a new threat model for producers of the said hardware. And uh, furthermore, it seems that Core Boot and Linux here really kept car hackers up until this point from uh, owning a Tesla, which is a good sign for the project security. And finally, um, when you have the threat model I just talked about, then you do need to consider physical attacks because the people owning your hardware have access to the hardware. We've responsibly disclosed everything, of course, and Tesla informed us about the updated situation with the real seat heaters. And yeah, that is everything for our talk. I would uh, like to thank uh, Oleg for his very important help, and I hope he can be the king of his car again. And if you want to look at our code, everything is available on GitHub. So uh, yeah, here's the link. Thank you.